We're very happy uh, in this week of the Western Hemisphere Virtual Symplectic Seminar to have Soham Chanda from Rutgers University speaking on invariants of floor cohomology under higher mutations. Okay, yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's a great honor to be speaking here. So today's talk is going to be about invariants of floor cohomology under higher mutations. And you can find the link to the article here in this archive link. So the goal of today's talk is twofold. At first, I'm going to define what a local higher mutation is, which is a geometric construction where you take a Lagrangian as your input and mutate it to create a potentially new Lagrangian. I mean, of course, it'll look like a different embedding, but this can be Hamiltonian isotopic. So it potentially can be a new Hamiltonian isotopic class of Lagrangian as your output. And the next part of the talk would be about how this change of Lagrangian affects the flow theoretic invariance of the Lagrangian. We'll be specifically interested in knowing how the flow intersection cohomology changes with some another Lagrangian, which is sitting away from wherever I'm doing this local change. And I'll be interested in how the disk potential also changes. And in this part of the talk, I'll talk about some technical things about broken maps, which is same as holomorphic buildings, if you have seen it before in SFT setting. Uh, and the last part will be a sketch of the proof. All right, so I'll start with the geometric construction part. So before that, some history of Lagrangian mutation. Uh, so at first, you can see Lagrangian mutation came up in Lagrangian torus, Lagrangian two torus, in almost toric vibrations in Symington's 2002 paper for four manifolds. So this is a symplectic four manifold, and there's a Lagrangian torus sitting inside it as a toric fiber. And as you do a nodal slide along a fiber, so let's say this is a fiber, and your Lagrangian is sitting here, and this is the pinched torus. And as you move this slide across this Lagrangian, then this fiber will get mutated. This can also be seen in Oru's 2017 duality paper. Uh, one thing I should mention that sometimes mutation is used as a word to describe a change of vibration. But for me, mutation is an operation on a Lagrangian. So I take a Lagrangian submanifold and then I create a new Lagrangian submanifold. So mutation is an operation on a submanifold. Later in Pascal of Tonkunok, they describe higher toric mutations. So in this, they define mutation for Lagrangian n torus sitting inside two n dimensional monotone toric symplectic manifold. My construction of local higher mutation is a localized version of the Pascal of Tonkunok's version of mutation. So instead of asking the whole Lagrangian to be uh, n torus, I will ask it to be a uh, torus. It ha I'll ask it to have a torus-like neighborhood and I'll do a mutation in a small Darbu neighborhood. Okay, so now we can get to the geometric construction. So as I said, it is a local move to, uh, which changes things in a Darbu chart. So I'll explain the local model first. And it starts off by creating Lagrangians in CN from curves in C star. So here I'm thinking of CN with the synthetic form, the standard synthetic form of not. So you start off with this map pi m, which is just you take the coordinates and you multiply them out. So this m stands for multiplication. And this map is a vibration with a singular value only at zero. And you can check that a fiber over any point which is not zero will be diffeomorphic to C star and minus one. Now, if you take a curve gamma, which is non-intersecting smooth path, and I assume that it doesn't hit zero, I can create this set T gamma, which is the set of points which lie over the fiber of the image gamma. So this was my gamma. And I restrict to those points which have equal norms on each coordinate. So what this does is that for each point, I have the fiber and I select a specific TN minus one torus. So this 
is a isotropic TN minus one sitting in the fiber. And I collect all such isotropic TN minus ones over gamma. This set turns out to be, I mean, as of now, it, I've just described it as a set, but it turns out to be a smooth Lagrangian submanifold inside CN. I mean, it will have boundary over this point, but then you can just change this to an open neighborhood to get no boundaries. And the way to see that this is a Lagrangian embedding is uh, an idea which has already been seen in like, for example, Seidel's work of leftist vibration is that T gamma can be thought of as parallel transporting this along the cur curve gamma, where you use the synthetic connection to do the parallel transport. So from now on, we should think of Lagrangians which have T gamma embedded in them as the Lagrangians which we can mutate. And I'll make it precise in a bit. So T gamma will be my model, which lets me do a mutation. Before I proceed on explaining mutation, I want to explain what happens when gamma passes through zero. As you see that I had asked gamma to be a map to C star before. But if I allow gamma to pass through zero, for example, if I take gamma to be a path, which is just the embedding of the real line inside C, then I define T gamma as usual, asking it to be equal norm on each point, then over zero, there's only one point which satisfies that, the fiber over zero. So you get that T gamma will have a conical singularity if your gamma Uh, if your path gamma passes through zero. And for the specific case of uh, the real embedding, I mean, like embedding the real line inside C, this T gamma you get is no, is a uh, Harvey Lawson double cone. So it is the conical singularity in a high Harvey Lawson vibration. So you can think of T gamma as desingularization of the Harvey Lawson singularity. All right. Uh, now I want to put some constraints on the curve gamma to make my life easier of talking about local models. So the main two constraints for gamma is I want the path gamma to lie on the real line inside C, which just means that near gamma zero and gamma one, I want this part to lie on the real line. And I also want the image of gamma to always lie on the upper half plane. So if this was the positive imaginary direction, I want gamma to always lie in this part. Okay, so now we can talk about locally mutable Lagrangians. So these are the Lagrangians which I can mutate. So the definition is you want to call a Lagrangian sitting inside M, M omega, a synthetic manifold, if you have a Darbu chart phi from a ball around zero to M, such that L looks like T gamma for some gamma admissible. So this is saying that phi takes T gamma to L. And I want two other conditions because I want to do floor cohomology with local systems on them. So this condition says that the induced map on homology from the inclusion of T gamma inside L is split injection. So this gives me something like H1L is a direct sum of H1 of phi T gamma, direct sum something else, which comes from the cycles of E here. And the other part is that I want L minus this, if I take this away, I still want the rest of the Lagrangian to be connected. Uh, important fact to note is that I want this to be a ball centered at zero. So I want my Darbu neighborhood to see that singular fiber over zero, somewhat. Uh, but I don't fix what the radius is. It could be any radius. All right, so this is a picture. So phi is the Darwin map, which takes T gamma to here. And 
by putting those topological constraints, I ensure that there is a cycle like this, which enters T gamma and leaves it. And this will be important later on to do some choice of local systems. Any questions so far for definitions? Okay, no, nothing in the chat. All right, feel free to uh, stop me if you have any questions. All right, so now we'll talk about mutations of curves. And since my Lagrangians uh, are coming from curves locally, to mutate a Lagrangian, I will define it as change the curve and replace by a new curve. So mutation of curves is something like I start with gamma admissible, and I create a new gamma, which I call gamma mu, such that near the ends, it is still same. So away from this highlighted neighborhood, gamma and gamma mu are exactly the same. But I am choosing gamma mu such that the concatenation of gamma and gamma mu gives you a loop around zero. So uh, vaguely, it means that if I went over zero in the upper half plane, I want it to go below zero in the lower half plane. But the reason I'm going slightly above is for some area reasons, which I'll explain later. So to be precise, I just mean that this concatenation is plus or minus one in pi one of C star, depending on how you orient gamma and gamma mu. So gamma mu is mutation of gamma. Okay, so at this stage, uh, we can define local mutation. So what it does is I take out T gamma, and then I replace it with T gamma mu. And I can, I mean, okay, I replace and glue it back. And the reason I can glue it back to still get a smooth object is because I had assumed that gamma mu and gamma are equal on the end. So pictorially, this is what's happening. You have a torus like here. So I'll call T gammas to be a, a torus segment. So I have a torus segment here, and then I re remove that torus segment, and then I replace it with a new torus segment coming from the mutated curve, T gamma mu. And you can check that doing so will still give you some diffeomorphic Lagrangian, but their embeddings have not changed. And this can potentially create new Hamiltonian isotopic classes, as we'll see later. Uh, one thing to note is that if n is equal to 2, this is equal to doing a Lagrangian disk surgery or Polterovich disk surgery. Okay. Uh, now I will go slightly towards the floor theoretic side. So before that, since I'll be only working in monotone floor theory for now, I need a proposition which says, if I start with a monotone locally mutable Lagrangian, I can choose gamma, I mean, I can choose gamma mu such that the mutation is also monotone. So this proposition is something like preservation of monotonicity. And from now on, I'll always assume that I'm choosing gamma whenever possible to preserve monotonicity. An example of such locally mutable setting is take the Clifford torus in CPN, and you can check that the Clifford torus is actually T of S1 using our usual, uh, using our notation T gamma, where gamma is equal to S1. So you can take the S1 as an embedding of a circle inside C star and then take T of that curve, and that curve lifts to a Lagrangian above in Cn, and that is on the nose just the Clifford torus. And once you do this mutation, you replace this part by something going like this. So you had that the circle was around zero, and after doing it, it goes around zero in the opposite direction. 
So zero is not in the center anymore. So for n equals two, this is the Clifford to Chekhanov torus. And this was the example Pascal of Tonkinov defined higher mutation for. So they took central Tory fibers and showed that you can create a chart like this. And then they defined the mutation to be replacing the circle by something which goes without having the zero in the center. One thing to note at this point is that in this example, this mutated Clifford torus is the theta n minus one twist torus, uh, which was in check and off lengths uh, 2007 paper about notes on monotone toric fibers, uh, notes on monotone torus. All right. So the question I want to ask is what is the relationship between the floor theoretic invariance? W and W and mu, the disk potential, and the floor intersection cohomology. So a schematic picture is I assume k is something away from wherever I'm doing the mutation. So this is where I'll call a mutation neighborhood. Mutation neighborhood, which is just equal to the Darbu ball embedded here. And I'm assuming that K is sitting away from it and it's transversely intersecting. So K doesn't really see whatever I'm changing this Lagrangian. And now I'm asking, does it affect the floor cohomology? From now on, whenever I say floor cohomology, I'm working in this setting of compact monotone manifolds. So for me, all the floor theory is happening in the monotone setting. All right, so now I can state the main theorem. So I assume that I have L rho L and K rho K are Lagrangians with local system where the Lagrangians are compact orientable spin, all the nice things to make my model space orientable. Uh, inside some M omega, a compact synthetic manifold. And I assume the following that L is locally mutable so I can do mutation. L K is a monotone pair which turns out important to make more complete theory work. And I want K to be away from the mutation neighborhood. And the third thing is a technical thing, which uh, I need to regularize broken maps. And I'm, I'm going to explain why I need this divisor existence later. So as it means such a setting, the result is that there is a change of local system from rho L to rho L mu, such that the disk potential does not change. And moreover, if you were allowed to do floor theory of L and K, then doing floor theory with rho L is same as doing floor theory with rho L mu on the muted Lagrangian. So you get invariance of floor cohomology as well. Okay. And this change of local systems can be explicitly described. So which I'll call the mutation of local systems. So under an appropriate choice of basis for H1L, the change of local system is something like the following. You keep most of the holonomies same, except one. So as I mentioned before, I wanted a loop which went around like this. Was it a question? Okay, no question. So yeah, I had set up my topology such that there is a loop going around the torus segment and closing up on the outside thing. And I'll call the holonomy on that to be Zn. And the mutation formula there is Zn goes to Zn times one plus Z1 plus Zn minus one. Here, Z1 to Zn minus one are the holonomies on a certain like you can pick any Tn minus one sitting inside phi T gamma and you fix some cycles on it and you name the holonomies on them as Zis and you fix them in the change of local system. Only the one which goes around gets changed. 
and all the cycles which appear away from the mutation, of course, I will just keep them the same. As I said, I needed a divisor assumption because in monotone setting, generally you don't need divisors to do uh, regularity proofs, but for that you need some kind of a pawn or Lazarini type of statement for holomorphic disks. But I'm going to use punctured holomorphic disks in a broken manifold or holomorphic building, and no such result exists, or I haven't found any result for punctured holomorphic disks with asymptotes going to reap chords for monotone setting, or just in any good asymptotic neighborhood of the infinity setting. So once such a uh, structural result for holomorphic disks is set up, I, will, I can just remove the divisor, axiom, uh, divisor assumption. All right. And one thing to note is that this kind of result was already uh, found in Aarhus 2007 T duality paper and Seidel's lectures in categorical dynamics for n equals two, which matches with the disk surgery. And this matches with the change of potentials for Pascal of Tonkonox higher mutation. Before proceeding, I wanted to explain some applications of such a theorem. So the first application is testing for Hamiltonian isotopic classes. As we see, we get that the disk potential as a polynomial will change because I'm changing one variable in the polynomial. So I can try to check if the new polynomial I get for the disk potential is different. So knowing W L to W L mu, this mutation of as polynomials, this can help you test if mutation is creating new Hamilton and isotopic classes. And this has been very successful for n equal to. Uh, Viana has created infinitely many to non isotopic tori in CP2 and other tori fourfolds. And Pascal of Tonkonog extended to all the other cases which were missed by Viana. And the other sort of application is a result like HFLK is same as HFL mu K will be important in some SYZ vibration mirror symmetry statements because L and L mu are both desingularizations of L naught where this L naught is a Harvey Lawson singularity. So if you have a SYZ vibration, generally you will have uh, singular fibers for at least n equals three would look something like this. And the point over and the conical point will look something like this pinched torus T3. And you can think of L and L mu to be desingularization in two different directions. And this relates them as what the objects are in the Foucault category. All right. So before I go towards the proof, I'm going to give a quick recap on some floor theoretic words. So I'm going to do floor theory with local system. So local system is nothing just a choice of a uh, flat C bundle over my Lagrangian L. And since it's flat, I get holonomy map row, which is all I'll remember from now. So this row tra keep tracks of what happens to the parallel transport as you go around the loop. So this is what row is doing. So it's a map from H1 of L to C star. And another term I want to define is a monotone pair. So monotone pair just means I have it's a stronger version of monotone Lagrangians. Instead of asking just disks to be monotone, I want annuli to be monotone. So this is the homotopy class of annuli. So elements look something like this. You have a boundary on L, you have a boundary on K, and I am looking at homotopy classes of annuli. And from here, you can get two functionals as usual. You get the Maslow index functional, and you get the symplectic area functional since you're lying on two Lagrangians. And I'll say L and K are a monotone pair if there exists a positive lambda such that you have this action index relation. And 
this forces M L K to be monotonic. And not only that, you also force that the monotonicity ratio for L and K are same. And this is something technical which you need for HF. Okay, so I'm going to now explain what this curve count is for a choice of a local system. So if you have seen the definition of this potential, it used to be you have you fix some point P. And then you count a holomorphic disk of Maslow 2 index, which are going through this point P, and you just add them up instead with one. And you have some sign coming from how you orient. But if you have a local system, you can also define this new version of this potential, which keeps track of what the boundary is doing to the holonomy or like how what the parallel transport is along the boundary. So instead of weighting it by one, I weight each this Q by the action of the holonomy on the boundary, which lies on the Lagrangian L. So the weight potential is the sum of rho del U, where U is a holonomy, uh, holomorphic map, P is on the boundary, and the Maslow index is two. Maslow index two implies that U is rigid. And HF can be defined similarly by having a strip and weighting this strip by how the holonomy acts on while going around like this. All right. So now I'll go towards a proof. So before I go uh, to the direction, I just want to step back and see what's happening in, in a geometric way. So this is my setup where L is getting replaced by L mu here and K is sitting somewhere away. And I'm assuming that the intersections are transverse. So L and L mu both intersect K in the same points because K is not seeing wherever I'm doing this mutation. So this is inside the neighborhood and that is outside the mutation neighborhood. There can be two types of maps. One type of map here would be strips which are completely lying on the outside or disks which completely lie on the outside. This will be same. This will be same for both L and L mu because the manifolds are same on that part. The only things which change are things which enter this neighborhood. And this are the maps which we want to study. And a very successful heuristic in this setup is to somehow break this count of curves by counting curves only on the inside and counting curves on the outside. And to do this in a rigorous way, the, we do a next stretch or we break the manifold. A uh, quick thing to note is that since I know that L and L mu are same on the outside part, as vector spaces, I know that CF, LK, and CF, L mu are the same because they have the same set of generators. All right. So we are going to use the technique of count of broken maps by breaking the manifold to obtain floor theoretic data. And this has been done by Charles Woodward in the floor flips paper in 2015. In their setup, they were counting where uh, discounting where you have Lagrangian sitting away and you have you, you have a separating hypersurface and you do a discount where this is the inside and this is the outside. And you do separate discounting and then you glue them back together. In our situation, we will do a next stretch along the sphere of the mutation neighborhood. So this is the sphere which separates the inside and outside, and, and I'm going to break the manifold along this. Okay, so I haven't explained what these things are. It was just a uh, nice linguistic way to explain what I'm going to do. But now I'm going to define all the terms I was using right now. So I'm going to talk about broken manifolds and broken maps. And the setup for doing this is you assume M omega is symplectic. Oh, I should mention broken maps are the same as holomorphic buildings. And 
it's just a linguistic choice of why I'm saying broken maps and broken manifolds, because I can talk about broken manifolds in this language. All right. So to do this breaking of manifolds and breaking of maps, I need to start with the setup where I have some symplectic manifold. And for simplicity, I'm assuming that Z is a contact type hypersurface, which separates M. So this is our setting where you have M inside and M outside, and Z is sitting here. And by contact type hypersurface, I mean that there is a tubular neighborhood around Z such that the symplectic form looks something like this. And an assumption I need is that Z is uh, S1 bundle over some symplectic manifold Y. And this S1 action is a S1 action near this neighborhood N. I'm not asking S1 to be a global Hamiltonian action. And I need the S1 action generates the deep field on Z. So by this, I mean the infinitesimal action. of S1 on Z will create the deep field for this contact form. And I will talk about holomorphic maps to such manifold. So I need a choice of complex structure. And since I'll break the manifold, I need the complex structure to be somewhat symmetric in that neighborhood. So I want this to be translation invariant in the second component. So I want to choose a J, which is same on each slice as I change the slice of Z. And I have a usual thing of having J to be adjusted to Omega, which is same as some version of saying compatible in some language. And in our setup, the Lagrangian is also crossing this neck region. So I want to have a Lagrangian inside M such that the Lagrangian looks cylindrical in some sense. So here, lambda is a Legendrian inside C. And I want in this neck region, L to be equal to lambda times the cylinder. And I want lambda to project down to some Lagrangian inside Y. And I want this projection to be a finite cover. All right. So this ends the setup of when I can break the manifold. So given such a situation, I'll call one part of L to be L inside, the other part of L to be L outside. And you should have the picture of L is a locally mutable Lagrangian, and this is a sphere. So it goes in and goes out. And this is where we really care about. OK, so in this setup, a uh, broken manifold is termed as uh, script M with L levels. And it is a collection of manifolds M in and M out uh, and some neck pieces M1 up to ML. So you obtain cap ML by taking this part out. So you take the M out twice and then you attach a infinite cylindrical over like a semi-infinite cylindrical piece over Z. So this is M in. Similarly, you define M out to be you remove the M in and attach uh, R minus times Z. And the M I's are neck pieces, which are just cylinders over Z. And you define a new complex structure on each of these pieces canonically, because you knew that in this cylindrical region, J was transition invariant. So you can extend it cylindrically to the whole of the semi-infinite cylinders. And similarly, you do it for all these cylinders. And of course, J was already defined for away from your neck region. All right, so this is my target. And a broken map is a map from a Riemann surface with boundary to this broken manifold. Uh, okay, I skipped some part of what saying what L is. Similarly to M, L is defined as you take the Legendrian and you attach cylindrical ends to it. OK, uh, the domain for broken map is a nodal domain. 
So I'm going to explain only the disk case and it can be extended to other cases very easily. So let's say you have a nodal disk and I add some decorations to it. I add labelings to each smooth part, which determines which piece of the broken manifold will go to. So this labeling allows me to say this part will go to M in, this part will go to M1, and this part will go to M out. And whenever I have a node between two, two pieces having different le levels or labels, uh, I can remember them as a special kind of node and I'll call them as puncture nodes. And a broken map is a collection of holomorphic maps to each of the pieces. So pictorially, it looks something like this. This piece is going to this disk. And whenever you are near a puncture node, you are getting asymptotically close to a reap chord or revolve it. So if this puncture node was on the boundary, then you go to a reap chord. So reap chords are from lambda to lambda, where lambda was my model for the cylindrical neighborhood of the Lagrangian. And if your puncture node was in the interior of the disk, then you would go to a reap orbit. And I have a notion of stability, which tells me that I want my broken maps to have at least one non-trivial map in the cylindrical piece. So whenever you have a cylindrical Z times R, you have a R translation, and I want at least one piece to be not translation invariant. Okay, so now that I know that puncture nodes are going to reap chords and reap orbits, there's a notion of matching them together. It is similar to how in a nodal disk, the nodes always go to the same point. Instead of going to the same point, we ask them to go to the same reap chord. So if you have a nodal disk and you are going to the puncture nodes from either side of the smooth components, you'll get two reap chords and I want those reap chords to match. And similarly, I want the reap orbits to match. And this object of broken map can be made into a modelized space. You can think of this as a modelized space because this is just a fiber product of modelized spaces of each piece where you are taking evaluations from both sides of the puncture nodes, the space of reap chords. So since it's a fiber product, you can think of it as some topological space. And similarly, you can define the notion of a rigid broken map is the same as whose virtual dimension is zero. So virtual dimension for me is the index quotiented by, uh, or the dimension quotiented by the automorphisms coming from the domain. I need to note that in contact homology, you quotient out by the R action here, but we do not quotient out by the R action in the neck pieces. Okay. Uh, an example of a broken manifold will be our exact setup we are going to break is you have phi of S to N minus one, the contact sphere of a Darbu ball sitting inside your manifold. And if L is locally mutable, you know L will be cylindrical here because you had assumed that gamma was on real line. So asking that to be on real line is same as saying that it is cylindrical in this small region near the sphere. And it satisfies all the other properties. Once I set my J to be the standard J naught in the Darbu chart. And in this setup, the broken manifold have, will have the inside piece to be CN and the neck pieces will be CN minus zero. And if I break a mutable Lagrangian, so assuming it was T gamma, I can extend gamma on both sides by just radially going outwards along real line. And 
the hell inside will the will the stretched hell would become just t gamma extended for this extension of gamma. So in picture it will look something like this. Okay. So as I said, broken maps are just holomorphic buildings. It's just a different name. And you can view broken maps as SFT limits of holomorphic maps under next stretching. And this was done by the compactness proof was proven by Bourgeois Ellisberg, Hofer, Visaki Zender, and Abbas and Kant in certain cases. Uh, one new feature I want to point out in our case is that we are looking for maps with boundaries on Lachandrians. And we have a Morse bot family of reap cards on Lambda. And that is because uh, my reap field is just the dev given by the S1, linearized S1 action on S2 and minus one by half vibration, the half action. And this is very symmetric. Since my, my, Lagrange, my Legendrian torus is very symmetric with this S1 action, you get that the family of reap cords is not non-degenerate. It's not singular. It rather comes in families as manifolds. So the reaper has a version of SFT compactness for this specific kind of setting. All right, now I'm going to talk about a sketch of the proof. And the sketch is you count broken maps to calculate the floor theory. And to do that, so we'll focus only on doing the invariance of HF. So I'll define a new D broken for CF L K. So this is the broken piece and K was sitting only on one side. It was always on the outside. And as vector spaces, this is again, just defined to be CF L K because all the intersection points are away. And I'll define a new map on this space as D broken. And I'll claim that computing chain homotopy, uh, the homologies are the same for D broken and the usual D. So then it will just result into counting what broken maps are. Uh, the steps of the proof is first, uh, and more, the hardest is the regularity of broken maps. So I want to make the manifold of I want to make the moduli space of broken maps to be regular to some extent so that I can do broken counts. Step two would be to show that CF with D broken is chain homotopic to CF with the usual D. And this was done already by Charles Woodward for even more generality for in the broken Fuka category case, where they proved that it's A infinity homotopic to the unbroken Fuka categories. And it was also done by Palmer Woodward in a recent paper on Lagrangian surgeries where it crosses the neck. And the last three steps are where I'm actually doing the computations for a specific case, which is I'll classify the domain types of rigid maps. So it will simplify my computation by knowing exactly what domain types occur. And you get that only domains which have no neck piece And, and the inside pieces only occur with one single boundary puncture are possibly rigid because of some index reasons. So in a quick picture way, uh, the crux of this is that only disks like this occur and disks which have two boundary punctures or boundary puncture and interior puncture will not occur as rigid maps. So after breaking it down to this case, we only care about this inside disks because L out is equal to L mu out. So if, so the maps on the outside pieces are exactly same for both pre and post mutation. So I'll just be worried about what happens to the inside disks, which have only single puncture. So the problem now reduces to classifying single puncture disks inside CN with boundary on the stretch Lagrangian, uh, Lagrangian. And this classification of single puncture disk is very similar to Seidel's classification of lifting disks to leftist vibrations. And the last step is to 
compare the boundary cycles of these interior disks and then glue to get back the floor theoretic result. So I'm going to skip over the details in for they are a different, there's a whole talk by itself. So I'll skip over what regularity proofs are. But the main point to get is that I can get regularity by choosing the standard J0 for interior and neck pieces and choosing some domain dependent J on the outside piece. And that gets you regularity for all virtual dimension less than equal to one. So that means that negative index don't occur. By negative virtual dimension, I just mean that negative index doesn't occur. Uh, step three is the chain homotopy part, which is already well known in the literature. In such setting, you do some SFT compactness and regularity and gluing the on gluing the broken things to get unbroken maps. So I'll proceed to step three. And these proofs will be quick proofs by picture. So the first part was you have no neck piece. And that is because you have that, you have at least one map, which is not translation invariant, just by definition of a broken map or a stable broken map. So if you had a neck piece, you can translate it in the R direction. And these things are different. This gives you a one dimensional family. And if you assume that your map was rigid, regular with neck, then you get that the virtual dimension at E U was at least one because you're getting one dimension family here. So that discounts neck piece. And now you want to say disks like this does not occur. And this is where I'll use the monotonicity by saying something. If I have some broken configuration like this, I can get a new broken configuration of smaller area and which will, you get that the area of this broken thing is smaller than the area of you. And then you would get from monotonicity implies you can't be rigid. All right. So after knowing this, I know that all possible broken maps will look something like this or broken strips would look something like this. You'll have one boundary lying on K on the outside piece and the other boundary of the outside piece lying on L out and L mu out. And the inside piece are what is changing from doing a mutation to post mutation. So the last step is to, I mean, the penultimate step is to understand what these disks are for both cases. And there is a classification result which says what these possible disks are. So you can also me, uh, ensure that your disks are asymptotic to the smallest reap chords. And there are only two types of small reap chords, which goes from plus to minus and minus to plus. And then you get an explicit classification result where you get that the model is place uh, which goes from one of the Legendrian torus to the other one is say plus two minus is exactly one. And, and this is more or less space with the choice of G naught in both cases. And going from minus to plus, you get N many more disks. And these are given by the specific formulas of taking just nth roots. And similarly, you get uh, if I do a mutation, so a mutation would be something like going from R plus I epsilon to R minus I epsilon, where I'm saying gamma can be approximated to the R plus I epsilon because it is above the puncture and gamma mu can be approximated to R minus I epsilon. And in that case, you will get that the discount flips. And you can compare the boundary cycles of these discounts pre and post mutation on the boundary. So for n equals three, you get that one type of disk occurs single here and it will get into three different disks. And the other type of disk occurs in three ways before mutation and they'll become one disk. That is this one to n and n to one phenomena, which occurs in the modular space. And you can check that the boundary cycles of these three things 
differ by going along H1 of the fiber of the torus. And then you check that these boundary cycles, the difference of the boundary cycles can be evaluated in a way so that you get, you can change the local system to get that your delta is exactly equal on the nodes. And rather I should say that rho L mu is defined so that uh, rigged to make del broken rho L rho K equal to del broken rho L mu rho K. So since you get that your del map is the same, the co-boundary operator is the same, you will get that the floor homology is the same. So yeah, that is how the proof goes. Okay, that ends the talk. Uh, thank you. Oh, I see there's a question right now. So maybe before the question, let's let's thank Swam for the talk. Okay, so after sneaking in that round of applause, yes, there's a there's a talk in the chat, and then I'll open it up to other questions. Can you say a bit more about how you keep track of areas when you mutate? Oh, okay, sure. So the way to keep track of areas is to, um, how should I say? So if you have this as gamma and then you change gamma to gamma mu, you keep track of areas by lifting disks on C to horizontally to disks on CN. So that way you can check that how to change gamma to gamma mu by saying something like this total area on the upper half plane should be equal to the total area on the upper half plane. I mean, of course, not upper half plane. I'll ask it to be equal on some disk. Like I'll cover it by... I'll make a big circle and say this total area should be same with a different symplectic form, not the standard symplectic form. You have to choose some nth root symplectic form to make this work. Does that answer the question? So any other questions? Well, actually, maybe maybe also I I have a question for you. Hmm. Um. So this this um the sort of local model for for this uh, higher mutation is sort of the the function from C n to C, which is like, you know, Z one times that times Z n, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And in dimension for n equals two, that's kind of equivalent to Z one squared plus Z two squared, sort of the the standard left shift vibration on. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes. Yeah. For so. For n equals two, this z1 times z2 is this is equivalent to z1 squared plus z2 yeah, squared. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is electric vibration. But I guess what I'm wondering is, and so a different way of generalizing the n equals two case would be to just take the Lefschetz vibration model in every in higher dimensions or yes, yes. some hybrid yes. between the two. And that has also been known. Uh, I mean, that is a disk surgery. I mean, uh, okay, I shouldn't say disk. Like you then have. Uh, a Lagrangian surgery happening in a low, in a higher dimension. So in that case, if you have, oh wait, I should use a better color. Pi L to be something from C N to C, which is just the left vibration C one, Z N, mm -hmm. to the summation of Z I square. Then if you have going from here to here, you can see that it is doing a surgery along the vanishing thimble over this path. So yeah, you can think of it as, uh, wait, what should I say? So yeah, you have a ball here, which, wait, I, I, I'm forgetting my left vibration, I guess. So you can do a surgery, Lagrangian surgery, which takes this model to this model. And this is was what was studied in Palmer Woodward. 
and their effects on like the Fuka category. I see. So I guess, I guess I was wondering if you, can you can you think of this sort of in the same in the same spirit by saying um, that, that you know the the object maybe like some object in the Fukai category remains the same if you turn on a local system or maybe in this case yes, maybe it has yes, to be higher, yeah higher yeah yeah that yeah 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 and the proof strategy is also very similar where you do a count of broken things yeah yeah that is exactly what is done in this paper I see so so then. It, is there some sort of natural family of surgeries which interpolates between these two? Because you would think, you know, there's one, you take a quadratic function or a degree n function, there should be some sort of whole family of surgeries that where these kind of uh, both, both sit as yeah. natural cases. The issue is that the singular fibers are very different. So in this case, when you're going over the zero, the singularity will be a uh, transverse self intersection. But when I'll, which is much easier to know than what happens when you have a conical singularity. I mean, okay, easier, at least I feel so. The singularity is much more worse in the case. So I would not expect that. I mean, maybe there is, but it will not be nice, maybe. I, I guess I guess one one way of thinking about it what what would the vanishing cycle be here right like in in, in the standard Lefschetz case it's a sphere right and in, in in Soham's case it's a torus right so so you if if you ask yourself like what's in between a sphere and a torus right. I mean I guess you could take products of sphere with tori but I, I mean nothing else is coming to mind is sort of really natural. I, yeah, I product of, it could be pr product of spheres of different dimensions. Yes, yeah, part of product of spheres. Yeah, there. I mean, that's a good question. There, there might be a result like that. Yeah, I guess that also sort of the the general spirit of the question would also be like, here you you kind of need this H one local system to be able to. You know, you, you sort of turn on this H1 class, but you could imagine some more general situation where you just turn on like an HK class to, in order to kind of, you know, get back yes. to the original. Yes. Uh, mm, but how would that be helpful in the, like, are you saying that, let's say you do not have this nice thing of H1 is split injection on that part? Um, in, in this particular case, probably it wouldn't it wouldn't help, but um, you could imagine some general situation. You could sort of instead of turning on a a lo an ordinary local system, you could turn on a higher local system, which would which sort of has the same effect. So yeah, I yeah, I, I think such something like that would still you'll still get some relation between change of local systems by knowing that what exactly the risks are. Yeah, I think after you get this classification of disk, you do get for even higher dimension local systems. I see. Anyways, yeah, that was less a concrete question than more just like you picked my interest. So I was just yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. They're great. Uh, any any other questions before we thank the speaker again? Okay, so well, thanks again for a nice talk. Thank you.